Good afternoon, everyone. It's Anthony here with Electrical Business Magazine. I am very pleased that uh, we're able to come up with this technological solution uh, to join you and to have a few words about where I see opportunities for contractors, electrical contractors, in the coming months and years. Uh, hence the title, they're serving Pi, and by they, I'm kind of looking at government, I'm looking at Ottawa and the provinces, and how big is your slice? And can that slice get any bigger? Can you have multiple slices? So in structuring this, uh, this conversation, um, it's really against the backdrop of the net zero world. Now, how long net zero is going to remain a catchphrase to be replaced by something else? Who knows? Uh, but right now, net zero it is. Uh, and as with all new things, there tends to be confusion about what these things actually mean. So in the case of net zero, the original understanding was net zero energy. Uh, but as the notion evolved, uh, net zero refers to these days commonly net zero emissions. And emissions are going to play a very important role in this presentation, in this discussion, and also in public policy and in the work you do. So when I look at kind of the, the current situation that we're in now and the foreseeable future, uh, the goal there is to achieve net zero. Uh, it's been told to us by Ottawa and we want to achieve that by 2050, so they believe. Uh, how do we get there? Well, a couple of important ways is energy efficiency, emissions reductions, you're gonna see a lot of that, and underpinned by wherever possible, electrification, which is good news for the electrical industry because public policy guides so much. Uh, let's take a look, quick peek at budget 2023 that came down a couple months ago and in terms of the government's priority areas. And you can see on the left-hand side, the things that are A, very important, prioritized in the budget, but also have to do with electrical contractors, not solely electrical contractors, but they're, I think, deeply and should be deeply involved in all of this. So I've kind of red starred electrification, obviously, clean energy, clean manufacturing, where electrical contractors can play a role, emissions reduction, definitely. Uh, now on the right hand side, I've also starred, though not as critical, uh, things like critical, let me say that sentence again, critical minerals, infrastructure and major projects. Now these aren't necessarily uh, specific uh, to electrical contractors, but they can play a role. Uh, Canada has outlined a critical minerals strategy. That's going to mean mining and processing. Uh, so we should be seeing more work, more opportunities there. When we look at infrastructure and major projects, these are some things that have been uh, perhaps you know, uh, the can was kicked down the road and someone else will deal with it in the future. You know, maybe it's roads, maybe it's airport, uh, airports. But one of the things that's going to be happening in the coming years, and I think we all know this, is our grid, the electrical grid across the country. That's going to need some serious uh, upgrading and updating to accommodate all this electrification that the government wants to talk about. So just quickly, getting into the budget itself. So some of the things that it contains. So we've got clean investment tax credits, clean electricity investment tax credits. So a 15% refundable tax credit for eligible investments in non-emitting, that's going to come up quite a bit, non-emitting electricity generation systems, energy storage. So we're looking at battery electric storage systems and equipment for the transmission electricity between provinces and territories. And again, that speaks to that uh, important grid upgrade that we need nationwide. Uh, so when you look at something like this, you think to yourself, okay, well, where could I possibly fit into this mix? These are the government's priorities. Uh, this is what they want to see built. Uh, these are the incentives that they're offering. Uh, how do I leverage my knowledge, my relationships with decision makers to make sure that I'm getting a piece of that pie? 
also under clean investment tax credits, clean technology manufacturing investment tax credit. Now, I don't assume uh, many, uh, perhaps some people in the room may be manufacturers, uh, but this is a credit for manufacturers uh, who are working on, you know, non-emitting uh, or product solutions that will ultimately become, you know, clean energy, clean technologies. Uh, so are you working with any clients that could benefit from this? Is this something that you can help them navigate, uh, endear yourselves to them uh, to ensure that you're winning that work and not someone else? Still there, expanding the eligibility for clean technology investment tax credit. Uh, now, this is actually an expansion uh, with Budget 2023. It was an expansion of something that already existed uh, so again, talking about clean electricity generation and storage, uh, low carbon heating. Uh, now that's going to involve heat pumps and I'll have a few words about heat pumps a little later on. Of course, zero emission vehicles. By and large, that happens to be electric vehicles still. I don't think hydrogen is really viable in the near and, and medium term future. What happens long term? I, I still remain skeptical. Uh, Budget 2023 is also saying it wants to invest in clean electricity. No surprises here. Uh, and it has given a mandate. Ottawa has given a mandate to Canada Infrastructure Bank to spend billions of dollars uh, for energy, uh, uh, for curtailing emissions, for advancing energy efficiency, uh, and also to support the building of clean electricity and infrastructure projects related to it. Still supporting clean electricity projects. So $3 billion over 13 years to uh, bolster an existing program. It's not a new program, the Smart Renewables and Electrification Pathways Program. Uh, and there's also an Indigenous uh, uh, component to this. And I'll, I'll get into Indigenous projects actually quite a bit later on because there's lots of opportunity there. Uh, again, you see things like electrification, smart grid. Uh, so again, as you look at this, who can benefit from this uh, uh, in your municipalities? Um, who do you know who might be interested in this, involved in this? What sort of solutions can you help bring? Um, what sort of knowledge uh, do you need to bring or do you need to enhance yourself with so that you can be you know, the go-to people for providing these solutions when people are confused? And there's a lot of that. Now, there's also enhancing a reduced tax rate for zero emission technology manufacturers. Uh, this is just a, a quick slide to say that finally, after you know years of lobbying uh, with budget 20, or sorry, I, it wasn't related to budget 2023, uh, an announcement was made, made prior, but then also included in the budget, um, that nuclear is a go. Uh, so whereas the focus had been for the longest time on wind or tidal or solar PV, now nuclear is being embraced again uh, because it is a non-emitting source of electricity. And most people would agree that it's probably the only uh, suitable baseload substitute, uh, you know, outside of, you know, large scale um, hydropower, water power, and possibly large-scale wind farms. Anyway, nuclear is a go. And just, you know, one more thing, one more highlight from budget supporting clean technology projects. Uh, so Ottawa wants to spend half a billion dollars to uh, or put towards a strategic innovation fund uh, to spur business investments to support clean technologies. Uh, so what technologies could possibly apply? Uh, what could you be working on or some of the people that you could be working on or sorry, working with on bringing these kinds of things to market? Uh, Ottawa has the money. It wants to give it to people. And so why not you? Uh, if not the whole thing, then at least some of it. Now, what I want to focus on here, just after giving you a whole bunch of things to think about, uh, is, you know, moving back to that, you know, blue triangle that I started off with, 
Uh, here I want to spend a little bit of time talking about electrified transport as part of the whole electrification equation. Uh, now, by now we're all familiar with, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, grants or, you know, some other sort of financial scheme to bring uh, electric vehicle charging infrastructure here and there for uh, let's say the average consumer, you know, that's, we, we know that, uh, and people are taking greater interest in that. I'm seeing more EVs on the road, uh, the, um, the, the subsidies to, to buy electric vehicles, you know, regular people, they still exist. Uh, so where I want to focus is, okay, where are the opportunities outside of the ones that we know about outside of the regular family car, so to speak, transit is a big one. So I want to spend a little bit of time here. And we reduce uh, our emissions if we can electrify, and overwhelmingly it will be electrification, if we can electrify our transit systems and our school bus systems. So I published this uh, two years ago, uh, but it's still alive and kicking, and that's the Zero Emission Transit Fund. And it has a 2.75 billion, that is not million, billion dollar purse uh, to help municipalities, transit operators. This fund will cover things like, you know, the planning and the capital costs, of course, purchasing the vehicles themselves. And to charge those vehicles, you need the charging infrastructure. And again, Canada Infrastructure Bank shows up uh, and it's committed to uh, invest 1.5 billion in zero emission buses. So a lot of money is being thrown at transit and we're probably going to see more. So Saskatoon Transit is receiving 336,000, again, through the Zero Emission Transit Fund. And this is just to plan for the electrification of its fleet. When you look at news like this, you know, like I would be asking myself, oh, okay, how do I get myself involved in that business? You know, with all this money being put toward public transit all over the country, uh, am I making the connections that I need to be making with the right people or the right entities uh, to ensure that I'm looked upon favorably, I know what I'm talking about, and people turn to me as an expert source and win the work. Now, stepping away from transit and getting into, again, stepping uh, uh, away from the regular residential stuff, um, electrified heavy duty vehicles are here. Uh, just recently published news of Loblaw rolling out its first fully electric heavy duty truck in the Montreal area. And those vehicles are going to need uh, charging infrastructure, uh, likely in more places than just at the yard. Sticking with uh, uh, electrified transport, again, away from the average consumer, let's take a look at Canada Post. So Canada Post has committed to electrifying its fleet of 14,000 vehicles. Uh, now this news item here, I think they uh, maybe picked up eight, 10 or so vehicles. Uh, so they're gonna have a massive job ahead of them to replace all their vehicles by, or sorry, 14,000 by 2030 and the entire fleet by 2040. So <laughs> they're gonna need a lot of people with a lot of experience to be able to make this happen. Same thing with Purolator, uh, which is majority owned by Canada Post. So they're going to spend massive amounts of money, again, to electrify uh, their fleet. And this is going to include the electrification of more than 60 terminals across the country. Uh, so who's winning that work? Are you winning that work? Uh, who can you work with, partner with? uh to to make sure that you're getting some of that business because you know having a a piece of one billion dollars you know that could go a long way uh, i had mentioned yards earlier so clearly others are seeing canada as ripe for selling their electrified transport solutions uh, so we've got orange ev coming into canada with their electric vehicle heavy duty uh hauler trucks, yard trucks, uh, to move trailers around at distribution centers. And now I don't want to avoid it completely, uh, but also touching on basically electrification and charging systems for everyone. There is the Zero Emission Vehicle Infrastructure Program, ZVIP, 
and uh, it exists to help bring uh, electric vehicle chargers uh, across the country. I mean, they mention here hydrogen refueling, but again, I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. I still think that's very far off. Uh, now, this is a big initiative. It has a, a big purse, $680 million, um, and it's still ongoing. It's available until 2027. Okay, getting back to my triangle here, looking at energy efficiency for buildings, emissions reductions for buildings. Um, so there's there's all kinds of things that we know about, have heard about, have read about uh, in terms of, well, LED lighting comes to mind. How do you make a building energy efficient? You know, what, what's the lowest hanging fruit? Always starts with the lighting retrofit. Uh, but let's get a little bit deeper to see where are some of the other possibilities. Uh, not to dismiss those um, uh, lighting retrofits because uh, there's actually still a lot of facilities out there that are not using LED lighting that still could benefit from that. And I'm thinking of older community centers, arenas uh, across the country that, that haven't been updated, upgraded, but the government, Ottawa, wants to update them and upgrade them as part of their mandate uh, for inclusive communities, energy efficiency and all that. So there's still opportunities there. I wanted to bring up this, uh, a couple of points from this ABB Energy Insight Survey. Uh, it's from this year, uh, January of this year, and they do this annually, uh, Energy Insight Survey. And they talk to business owners from around the world, uh, 27 different countries or something like that. And uh, energy instability, it is a concern. It is a worry. 92% uh, of respondents uh, say that, you know, energy, I'll say energy security, is threatening their profitability and competitiveness. Um, sort of as a footnote to that, you know, how will they meet their sustainability targets? And actually where these business owners are concerned, their energy costs are of greater concern than reducing emissions. Uh, they likely wouldn't say that, you know, publicly if the cameras were turned on to them, but costs are a real thing. And it's something that shows up on the bottom line and they want to deal with it. Uh, a third of businesses uh, from this survey uh, are put off implementing energy, any energy efficiency measures uh, because uh, they're worried about how much it will cost and what the payback will be. And almost half feel they don't have the know-how or the resources to move forward uh, with energy efficiency measures. So to me, this this smacks of um, ripe fertile ground to be that solutions provider that can address owners speak to owners educate them on okay well here are the things that can be done that we can do as electrical professionals uh, to not only help you achieve greater energy efficiencies but perhaps manage manage the energy that you're using now better uh, maybe that's with Again, there's that LED lighting retrofit, but also controls, occupancy occupancy sensors combined with daylighting, stuff like that. And, you know, my belief is that when it comes to these kinds of things, uh, this is where the electrical contractor can shine uh, because you have the knowledge. Uh, there's knowledge across the industry about these kinds of solutions. And I think um, you're well positioned to discuss those solutions and and sell clients on them. Energy efficiency is a big thing and it will continue being a big thing. It is a, a free fuel and um, it also leads to by default reduced energy uh, or sorry, emissions, reduced emissions. So just one quick example here. Uh, this is a program uh, again from Ottawa, Green and Inclusive Community Buildings. And in this case, you know, the Hepburn in Saskatchewan uh, is uh, receiving 2.3 million from that Green Inclusive Community Buildings program. The town itself is contributing nearly 600,000 uh, to renovate this existing structure. Now, all kinds of things are gonna be renovated there. Uh, the heating and cooling system, again, lighting. 
uh, Windows, and there's there's something I want to speak to about uh, Windows a little later on, and there's some other things there too. Installation of automatic door openers to in, include uh, accessibility. So when you look at some of these uh, or a project like this, and there are many others, uh, you know where do you see yourself? Where can you lend your expertise? Uh, because there's going to be more of this. We have a lot of building stock uh, across this country, older building stock uh, that. You know, Ottawa and the provinces are going to want to upgrade over time. And it starts with these kinds of things. What else could you add to that? A little closer to home, this one is the Green Municipal Fund, uh, which is delivered by the Delivery Agent Federation of Canadian Municipalities. Uh, and this one, or this project, I should say, uh, receive money from all kinds of places. So there's six and a half million from National Housing Co-Investment Fund. Uh, there's 2.9 million from Natural Resources Canada. And you know there we see the Green Municipal Fund from Federation of Canadian Municipalities and nearly 6.3 million from Canada and Alberta National Housing Strategy and you know, 1.1 million. Anyway, all kinds of money is being thrown at this project from all kinds of sources. Um, and uh, a lot of the technologies uh, include you specifically, rooftop solar PV for the structure and the parking structure or for the, the facility and the parking structure. And of course, efficient lighting. Emissions reductions, you know, that is the key. Um, that is the holy grail, if you will, uh, for us to get to net zero. And there's some important news here that may not affect you yet, uh, or it might, uh, but I think this is something to watch out for. So uh, not that long ago, Government of Canada uh, wants its suppliers. Uh, now, this is currently for procurements over $25 million, uh, to start disclosing their greenhouse gas emissions and to set reduction targets. Uh, now, again, this is for a Government of Canada supplier, currently procurements over 25 million. But how long before um, Ottawa, if we do any federal work, uh, is going to just say all procurements? Uh, how long before the provinces themselves, territories themsel themselves, also start demanding uh, these GHG uh, emissions declarations and declarations of your reduction targets. Now, you might say to yourself, well, I've, I don't do any work with Ottawa. Well, it, it may involve you um, sooner than you think, uh, because um, if the system weren't confusing enough already, uh, emissions uh, come with three different scopes. And if you've heard this before, uh, just, just bear with me. Uh, but I think it's important to understand these scopes and their differences. So uh, when it comes to emissions, you know, there's scope one, emissions that you yourself, uh, you know, make, if you will. So when, when you hop in your truck and you go off to work, okay, this is a scope one emission, your truck. Uh, when you go to the, uh, when you go to the, uh, to work and that shop is using electricity and maybe that electricity is being generated by a coal fired plant. Well, those are scope two emissions and that's kind of a knock on you as well. Now scope three emissions. These are emissions that are not produced by you. Uh, not produced by, say, a utility, uh, but they're part of your uh, your your chain. Uh, so let's say uh, a general is is bidding work, uh, government work, Ottawa work, and you know they have to report their emissions, scope one, scope two, scope three. You, as the electrical contractor, uh, being subbed by that general, you would be scope three. So they are now wearing your emissions as well and that could impact their ability to win that federal work uh, again currently procurements over 25 million so I'm, I'm not saying it's something you need to worry about right now or lose sleep over right now but keep an eye on it my feeling is it's coming now some tech to watch i mean there's always cool interesting things going on 
Ah, a small modular reactor. So you know, I said near the top that uh, nuclear is a go. And this is something that the nuclear industry, Canadian Nuclear Association, uh, has been desiring and lobbying for, uh, well, for years now. Uh, and it finally seems that uh, nuclear is again being embraced. I mean, it's not a new technology or nuclear power, uh, but where kind of all the excitement is right now is on these small modular reactors, um, SMRs or VSMRs, very small modular reactors, also called micro reactors. Uh, so why are people excited about this? Well, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of them, SMRs can be factory built. So it's not a huge nuclear build that uh, sadly these things are almost always plagued with cost overruns. Um, so they're factory built under controlled conditions. Uh, they're modular. They can be customized for the application at hand. So maybe the application at hand is a remote First Nations community uh, where it's too onerous, too expensive to connect them to the grid. So that's a great application um, and uh, remote resource uh, operations as well too. Uh, the other benefit to these uh, when they come to fruition will be they can be used in combined heat and power applications because they're going to make heat. So rather than lose that heat, waste that heat, uh, where else can we use it? Now, here is a big question. Uh, it's something that I, I hope to explore and investigate in the coming months is where does the electrical contractor, can the electrical contractor fit into this SMR equation? Or will it be solely the purview of utilities, uh, you know, like the Ontario Power Generations or the Sask Powers or the New Brunswick Powers? Is it just going to be them uh, doing all of this along with their suppliers who are building the, the small modular reactors? Uh, anyway, it, it is a technology to watch because I think it's, let's call it novel because it's not the nuclear of the past. Uh, it is the nuclear of the future. Uh, just remains to be seen who gets to participate in that, who will benefit from it. Another thing that uh, I want to put on your radar as a thing to watch uh, are the murmurings uh, for DC power, direct current power in our buildings. There are inefficiencies when power has to be converted from one uh, current to the next. I would say it's gone past musings to the point where people are now talking about this uh starting to you know weigh the benefits should ac remain our standard uh now bear with me uh this this could be distant future but maybe not so distant future i've already said you know dc it eliminates those inefficient power conversions uh when we look at things like poe lighting uh, and basically all the electronics that are going into smart, intelligent buildings, you know, there's DC power. You know, that is kind of the default. One of the things that's covered in LEED is uh, it's kind of a points system and you get so many points under this category, that category. Um, and that's how you achieve uh, certain levels of certification under the LEED system. So maybe your LEED Platinum, LEED Gold, and, and it speaks to just how awesome this particular facility is. And LEED uh, certification system offers one of those points a credit uh, for exploiting DC electricity. All right, so just finished talking about direct current in buildings, plant that seed and see where it goes. Um, we've all heard IoT, Internet of Things, and you know how does that uh, coincide with our built environment and where could possibly the electrical contractor fit in with all that? Uh, there's a local organization, uh, if you've not heard of it, it is based in Alberta, and that is Alberta IoT. One of the things that I found very interesting uh, in, in this particular session that uh, I attended, uh, one of theirs, Intelligent Building Symposium, is an intelligent building um, is going to have to uh, leverage all its resources, all its um, you know horsepower uh, to try to find energy savings where possible. 
who puts all of this together? Uh, so if you've got IoT sensors, you've got all these disparate systems uh, monitoring the daylighting, monitoring the occupancy, all these other things, who's going to put that together? Who's going to assemble it all? Who's going to commission it all? Who takes care of that? Who could that be? Could that be you as the electrical contractor? Who is the master integrator? Something to consider. Now, the reason I want to spend some time here is this is probably where uh, we will continue to see uh, a lot of funding, uh, a lot of support for these kinds of projects that involve Indigenous communities. Uh, so taking a look at one just for example, uh, you know, this Gull Bay mic microgrid project, uh, this is northern Ontario. So this was a community that was getting off diesel. Uh, now, if I remember correctly, it was actually there it is right in the slide. Uh, it also received support monies uh, from the feds uh, indigenous off diesel initiative. You know, they ended up going with a solar plant, uh, some battery energy storage. Uh, and you know, I checked this uh, just two days ago. Uh, so this clean energy for R rural and remote communities program has new funding. Uh, so it hasn't run out. I mean, it is still there, alive and well, new funding available. You know, getting to uh, just that clean energy and remote communities program. So an additional 300 million is available until 2027. Uh, and this program provides funding for renewable energies uh, and energy efficiency measures. So renewables are kind of a given, uh, but there's definitely an emphasis on energy efficiency everywhere and throughout. Uh, and again, the goal is, you know, let's tackle those emissions. Let's get off fossil fuels uh, for heating and definitely the diesel for electricity and try to bring in renewables. And there's many more examples. Uh, so I try to grab examples from, you know, all over the country. You know, we got uh, Quebec in there, Ontario is in there. I believe the energy peers uh, was possibly Saskatchewan. So here is where there is lots of opportunity, but it's not opportunity that someone can just waltz in and take. Uh, here's why, where, you know, in, in my own limited capacity, uh, acknowledging that I'm probably still largely ignorant of a lot of things, uh, I want to talk about Indigenous relations. So we've likely all heard of uh, the Calls to Action, Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada's Calls to Action. Uh, the one that I want to focus on is the Call to Action number 92. Uh, which is specific to business and reconciliation. What are some of the things that we see under business? Well, commit to meaningful consultation, respectful relationships, informed consent. Um, and one of the other points is ensuring that, um, you know, Aboriginal peoples have access to those jobs. They get training. Uh, the community is included. There are economic uh, benefits. Uh, basically partnership. Uh, how do you make sure that you're sort of crossing all the T's, dotting all the I's uh, to ensure that you're as ready as you can be to be a participant, um, you know, in Indigenous led uh, or Indigenous involved opportunities? Uh, because this is this is very key. You've got to have skin in the game and that's long term skin in the game. Uh, so one of the ones that um, I've learned about and I've spoken with the people there is we've got the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business. Um, I'm, I, there may be others, uh, but this one you know, is national. It is recognized and they have a program called Progressive Aboriginal Relations, the PAR program. Uh, and basically it uh, certifies you you know, through your actions and what you're doing, uh, that, yeah, you would be a good partner with an Indigenous community, a First Nations community, Aboriginal community. So I highly recommend that um, if you're interested in pursuing, you know, work partnerships uh, to develop things in Indigenous communities to, you know, bone up on what it takes to to be a partner, to have progressive Aboriginal relations. When I was interviewing Fiona Blondin, uh, sorry, Fiona Blondin, 
when she's talking about partnership, and I quote her here, when I say good partners, I mean partners who share the same values around the environment, around our relationship, so relationship between the community and you, around our future and around employment. So something incredibly substantive, a lot of thought, a lot of actions. Now, I want to close out with workforce opportunities um, because we're going to need people and well Ottawa has answered the call uh, and others as well too but Ottawa has answered the call by funneling money through delivery agents uh, to get cash into the hands of employers who will take on apprentices uh, so last year roughly around this time Canadian Apprenticeship Forum uh, got 45 million uh, from Ottawa uh, for employers or to distribute amongst employers uh, to take on apprentices. Uh, now they in turn shuffled it to a couple of other delivery uh, agencies. Uh, so there's, you know, Aboriginal Apprenticeship Board, Build Force Canada, Canadian Construction Association, of course, Canadian Apprenticeship Forum itself. Uh, this slide here just uh, shows a webinar uh, that was conducted by my colleague Doug, um, actually chatting with one of the people at Canadian Apprenticeship Forum uh, who helps give out money to employers. Uh, and this webinar included an employer, a uh, metal worker, I believe, um, who used the program to get cash, uh, to get money to take on an apprentice. Uh, so here we see some of the opportunities uh, of people, employers, and the work being done uh, that would, at least in the case of Canadian Apprenticeship Forum, um, you know, get government money to take on those apprentices. So we see construction, uh, construction electrician, power line technician. So now this is just focusing on Canadian Apprenticeship Forum and, and some of its delivery agents, but it's 5,000 per apprentice. Uh, now, what's interesting here is the the ten thousand dollars. So double the amount if you're taking an apprentice first year um, from an equity deserving group. Well, we can probably guess some of those, but here are those um, equity deserving groups. So women tops the list. Indigenous peoples, newcomers, persons with dis uh, disabilities. Um, Electricity Human Resources Canada uh, also has a similar scheme. Actually, they have uh, several schemes. Uh, so again, they have money uh, that they are delivering, you know, for the government for hiring first year apprentices. Uh, but they have several schemes. So one of them is Discovering Potential Program. This is Electricity Human Resources Canada, uh, up to a maximum of 25000 per participant uh, under this program. Uh, there's also a workers in transition, possibly up to 15,000 or up to 50% of the wages. So that's where I want to wrap it up. And I wanted to conclude with this um, because I think it's really important that you take advantage uh, of these uh, grants, these monies to take on staff, apprentices, train the next generation, uh, because if it's being offered, uh, then let's take it. Uh, but that sort of concludes my formal presentation. Uh, so why don't we open it up to Q&A?